All right, we are gonna get back started with our conversation. I love this. I love the idea of lifting women up, um, like the supervisor mentioned, taking, connecting, making new connections, figuring out, okay, who am I gonna tag on social media? Who am I gonna lift up? That's such a wonderful spirit to bring into this, into this <laughs> space. So I really appreciate this, the supervisor for mentioning that. Um, I do have to share, I know I read a little bit from Rest is, Resi is Resistance. I, I feel like this is rest. This is such, right? I feel like, you know, being in spaces like this, where you fill your cup, where you re-energize, this is rest. And so we are locked in arms with each other right now in resistance. How exciting is that? Okay. So, um, Today is also about creating a space that is safe, that's brave, that's empowering, so that we can go back to doing the good work and the very difficult work of achieving housing justice in the Bay Area. So in our conversation, we're gonna be t building off of last year's Women's Brunch, where we discussed how we can effectively forge the path of equity in housing despite the, div the divisive political environment we experienced in Santa Clara County. This year, we're gonna focus a little bit more on empowering women leaders by discussing the diverse experiences we face in the housing field. We want the audience, you all, you, you beautiful folks who showed up today, to leave more grounded so that you can navigate difficult work environments and create spaces that will help facilitate leadership and success. We'll also further explore how we can leverage the power of our racial diversity in Silicon Valley so that we can create systems shift towards a multiracial democracy. Um, so today we're joined by two extraordinary women who are leaders, not just women leaders, leaders in our space committed to building diverse and affordable communities throughout Silicon Valley in California. Today we're joined by California State Controller Malia Cohen. And Camille Yanis Fontanilla, Vice President of Silicon Valley Programs at Sobrato Philanthropies. Camille Yanis Fontanilla is the Vice President of Silicon Valley Programs, which means she's responsible for the overarching vision and strategy for local giving across Silicon Valley. Camille has worked in the nonprofit sector for nearly 20 years, working in community development, education, and economic mobility. Prior to joining the Sobrato organization, she served as the Executive Director of Somos Mayfair working alongside community members to spur resident-led solutions. Camille was born and raised in East San Jose and continued to raise her two young children there with her husband. Controller Malia Cohen was elected in November 2022, and her primary responsibility is to account for and protect California's financial resources. She serves on 70 boards and commissions with authority ranging from affordable housing to land management and crime victim compensation. Controller Cohen was previously elected to the State Board of Equalization in November of 2018. It's a long list of things that she's doing. Um, again, so appreciative to both of you for being here today. And I'm just gonna get out the way because we're excited to hear y'all in conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Regina. <laughs> this one on? Yeah, great. Good morning, Controller Cohen. It is truly an honor to be here in this conversation with you this morning. 
Um, and as someone who was born and raised also in the Bay Area, I'm grateful for the work that you've done in San Francisco, San Mateo County, and now across the state. While our paths have yet to cross, we just met this morning, um, I have followed your work and from afar and how have so much respect for your leadership, especially in the areas of addressing barriers to employment, supporting the immigrant community fiercely, addressing gun control, and advancing affordable housing. So I'd love to start our conversation there. All of these issues, and particularly for this group, affordable housing, are really hard issues to work on. And they are some of the greatest challenges facing our communities. Can you share how you've had to show up and lead in these spaces? What kind of leader do you strive to be? Well, good morning, ladies. How are you? I want to thank Regina and her incredible team that reached out like three months ago to get me here. She, she texted me. She was like, can you come? And I was like, that's in three months. I don't even know if I'm going to be living. I don't, I, don't, I don't know if I can commit. But here I am, and the sun is here. I'm so excited to be down here in the South Bay. And Camille, I just want to say, you are so accomplished, but you did not get an eruption of applause until they said you were from East San Jose. That's right. Then the audience <laughs> woke up. They were like, oh, yeah, she's one of me. I see her. She sees me. So, yeah, forget about she's a corporate leader. She's giving money, making money. She's from East San Jose. Priorities. Always. I love that. I um I just want to also share a little bit about in my background. I grew up in San Francisco, so I'm just a few minutes north of where we are. I um, graduated from the public school system. I went to Fisk University, one of the oldest, nation's oldest HBCUs. Thank you very much. And also graduated uh, with a graduate degree from Carnegie Mellon University. But I really, my real, my real um, challenge in life where I test my chops and my resiliency is being a mother of a three-year-old, yes, who is made the transition of not peeping in the bed all night and able to sleep all night. Congratulations. So you hear the hoarseness and the raspiness in my voice because she brings a lot of colds and bacteria and stuff into the house. So you all are clapping as you know what I'm talking about. But so um, I would have to say that it's a privilege to be here to recognize um, the leadership that's on the stage, but also the leadership that is before us on this lawn. Thank you for showing up and holding it down and representing in every single space that you're standing in. I um, have been a student of Cindy Chavez for many years, even before I was even elected. And um, so to be able to share space and, and be in her presence is always a privilege and I'm, I'm grateful. And also want to recognize all the candidates that are in the room that are running Ooh. for office and are slated to win. Hint, hint. Thank you. Okay, now what was the question? Yes, well, we, I, we've learned so much about your background, which is incredible. And I think we can tell about your leadership. I, I'm seeing authenticity and strength. Um, what are the values and, and what do you strive to be as a leader? I think the, the one number one thing when I think about leadership is that, um, first of all, I have to give credit to my mother. My mother identified leadership in me very early. But I think that has to do with because I'm the eldest of five girls. And so I've always been organizing and leading. But if you talk to my younger sisters, they say I've been bossing. I've been bossy. I used to call me Bossy the Cow. They even bought me like this little night shirt that said Bossy the Cow on it. And my sister Erica in particular likes to highlight that one. But I, we say that kind of jokingly, tongue in cheek, but it's true. I have been organizing like family pictures, my parents' wedding anniversaries, what we're going to get them, a group collectively. Now, as a 40 plus year old woman and way busy, I now delegate. So, delegation is a huge part of my leadership style now. You heard in the bio, sitting on 70 different boards and commission, largely sitting in the capacity of um, looking at things through a fiduciary lens. Now, <clears throat> I know many of you might have been like me when I started my journey. I served eight years on the board of supervisors in San Francisco, and I never considered myself to be a numbers person. And then I was like, that's just fear and intimidation in the patriarchy that told me that I wasn't good at it. And I am really good at it. And I bring a certain level of experience, like you know, being in a space and being invisible, being in a space and saying something, but having your male counterpart repeat it and it gets validated. I was like, fuck that. <laughs> Put me as chair of the budget. And I was chair of the budget and I redid the budget system. 
the process, the budget process, and I brought transparency. So to answer your question, my leadership style is about transparency, opening things up, because I firmly believe that you should not need a lawyer or a lobbyist to intersect with government. We are here to serve. And many of you are in the nonprofit space are also here to serve. And even in, in the corporate side, our life is about service, and that is what um, makes us human, and that's what connects all of our humanity. So if I were to sum up my leadership style, I'd say it is first servant leadership. I like to lead from the back, personally, but sometimes um, meaning that I can recognize the leadership and the qualities in other people and step aside and say go for it and empower people. But the other thing is, is um, in terms of values leading, uh, transparency, honesty, integrity, being able to say no and standing by my no, bending but not buckling. And I think those are some really critical um, uh, leadership traits and values, and then also being able to disagree without being disagreeable. I love that. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you. And she also said delegation. So I know there's a lot of executive directors in the house, um, and having been one, y'all, we have to delegate, right? We can't, we can't do it all. And Regina started this um, brunch talking about rest and how that is the resistance. So I just want to make sure that y'all are leaning into that as well. So we know that leadership is shift, shifting rapidly, and especially following the pandemic, we're seeing organizational leaders transition, especially in the nonprofit sector. But we are also seeing diverse leaders um, step into these roles, um, women of all backgrounds. And so what opportunities do you see for this next generation of leaders, and, and what are the challenges as well? So even on the drive down um, this morning, I'm in the car, I'm listening, I'm participating in a pitch summit this entire weekend. You familiar with a pitch summit? You guys familiar with Shark Tank, right? Yes. You have a business idea, you're pitching a set of investors and hoping that they will ask questions and that they will invest in your company. And the whole reason why we're doing this is because the, the BIPOC community, women of, color, women of color that are CEOs, that are leading corporations and starting businesses, they are not getting that same seed money for their venture, for their, um, for, um, to help them start their business. So, um, you know, from my perspective, it's really about chipping away at that patriarchy and um, being fearless and stepping into a space where we are accountable to each other and to those that we are, that we are leading, but also uh, remembering that we are lifting as we climb, that we are bringing people with us as we continue to go down this journey. So that for me, I started off as an intern working on a campaign. I love interns. I think that that is a great opportunity. The second opportunity I think are informational interviews. Continue to conduct them so that people know what's happening. Housing and the housing market and finance around housing, it's so mysterious. It's so mysterious. Um, and I wasn't even exposed to it until I was elected on the Board of Supervisors. But one of the criticisms that I heard when I was running as a first time candidate in 2010 was, how do you know how to, how to negotiate a multi-million dollar contract? Well, I didn't, but I learned. And, and I learned because there were people that were around me that poured into me that, that showed me basic skills on how to, um, how to hold your own, how, to, how negotiations, how housing gets built, how projects get built, and more importantly, how they get tanked. So I know oh, you laugh because you know about that life too. <laughs> um, so that is, I think, the culmination that really brings me to this space. Oh, that, that actually really resonates. So um, just a little bit of background on, on something that I worked on before moving into philanthropy. Um, when you work in a neighborhood context, I started working in early education first and then K through 12 education because in a neighborhood, a family experiences all of it all at once, right? And so right at the end, kind of got called to work in an affordable housing space. And, and to your point, I, I didn't know anything about it, um, but I knew it's what our community needed. And I just want to acknowledge, um, there's so many women in this space who poured um, knowledge, networks, um, access to a lobbyist. Um, a woman helped fund a lobbyist for my organization because to your point, the way in which we're currently structured, I, I didn't understand the budgets. And, but I was getting tired as a community organizer being told that things don't pencil. And I know like that's the go-to line. And so I think you're right. Like we have to share knowledge with each other so that we can understand how, how things can pencil so our communities can get what we need. So I appreciate you sharing that. 
I, you mentioned a little bit about this already, but I think what can we do collectively? There's incredible women here. You, you talked about pouring in knowledge, bringing in networks. What do you think we as a community of women have to collectively do to support this next generation and to like really push these really huge challenges that are confronting our communities right now? I think we should keep it real and, um, and, and not sugarcoat what life is like and um, but inoculate them and encourage that they can do it, they will do it, they will be successful, um, and also bringing them to the table. So making sure that they have an opportunity to observe, to listen, and to learn on how things are going. I, I have a story, I, I was, um, a, um, I was uh, in Gavin Newsom's office, he was the mayor of San Francisco, and this was during this first administration, I was a field organizer and I transitioned with the team, and I remember I went to his chief of staff whom I was supporting, and I said, I'd love for you to be my mentor. And we laugh about it now, but it wasn't funny then. <laughs> he said no. Oh. He said no. I was like, you know, overachiever here, not accustomed to the word no. <laughs> and certainly didn't stop at it. And I was like, you don't want to be my mentor? He was like, no, you don't need a mentor. I'm too busy. And that really resonated with me because I was like, wow. And I remember thinking, I will never be like that. Um, and I made him my mentor, whether he knew it or not. I was always <laughs> watching ask, and asking questions and making him explain it to me, making him make it sense yeah. to me. And I think that we um, need to not be threatened by the future generation. Because um, yeah. I think sometimes when you're a woman or a woman of color, they, they, they set up the system where you can only be one or maybe one of two. But yep. making sure that when we are when we are in uh, and when we have opportunities um, that we're bringing people. Another a case in point: before I was a candidate, when I was a candidate running, um, there was a woman that would buy tables at the events. You know, you go to these events. I couldn't even afford a table, let alone a ticket. But she invited me to sit at her table, and that is how I was also able to network and watch and learn, listen to speakers, and be just exposed. She would just say, "Hey, I, I, you need to be in this space. I bought a table. Come be my guest." was a game changer, a game changer. So think about that when you're doing your own events, bringing someone, even if it's a relative, just someone mm -hmm. to the table that is the, of the future generation so that they can learn and watch uh, and how, how, how we operate. Absolutely, thank you. Um, I think for me, one of the things that I constantly think about when you said you know, you're one of two women of color sometimes in these leadership spaces, I, I've really been reflecting lately, having moved into the corporate sector um, around how do I show up with my purpose and what needs to be created in a space to have a sense of belonging. And I'm just really, for me, I know I've needed that to thrive and I'm curious how you create and foster safety and belonging, especially for other women in, in your workplace. That's an interesting question. How do I foster safety and belonging? Um, I lead many teams, campaign teams, um, uh, in the state controller's office, uh, we have 1,600 employees, about 274 auditors, there's CPAs, there's admin, there's lawyers. And so um, for me, it's about creating a space where people can be seen and be heard. So the first thing I did, uh, the first um, several months in being in office, I held 22 hours worth of just listening sessions from people that have worked in the state controller's office so that I can understand the culture and the dynamic and understand from people their work experience, their lived experience in working in the controller. Why, what kept them there? What, what, why were some of them leaving? What, and you know, I heard of many different things about there are not, there are in, um, infrequent opportunities for, for upward mobility. I heard that there was racism. I heard that there was classism and sexism. I heard that there was Islamic phobia. So in taking all of this, re-envisioning uh, the mission, this vision and the, the goals of the state controller's office, um, making sure that people were not working in silos but chipping down those silos so you knew what um, different bureaus were doing. Um, also uh, bringing an element of fun. I think that anytime you come around food, is fun. I'll even throw in karaoke. So I mean, it's it's a really interesting bowling night. I mean, there's and, and this is again coming out of COVID, right? Um, where the a, entire agency had shut down and everybody was back at home for a number of years and working and loving it, I might add. 
Um, so really trying to find that hybrid. So it was coming in and just listening about what people wanted to make sure and that the SEO still brought a certain high level of integrity in the work that we're producing for the state of California and for on behalf of taxpayers, but then elevating and making it a desirable place to work. And so that you felt comfortable to wear your hijab. You felt comfortable to wear the Star of David around your neck and that we were still able to coexist and to work and remembering that we are serving Californians and not ourselves. Absolutely, that's great. You, you touched upon it and, and I think this is one of the, the greatest crises facing our community and at a macro level, but also in our communities. We, um, especially in the Bay Area, are, are very diverse. We are multiracial um, and sometimes our movements don't create the space for us to come together on these issues. And so I'm just curious, um, in the movement space, in bringing different groups, ethnic backgrounds, races together, how can we advance a multi multiracial democracy, especially around issues that affect many of us, housing, economic mobility? I mean, I think you start what you see, what you see not happening around the college campuses, right? You have the administration shutting things down, turning to, uh, um, law enforcement response and not listening and embracing, right? And that also goes on the student side, not listening and understanding the perspective about how to run a business, how to run an organization, uh, how to run a university. And I think um, that w there needs to be uh, a more of a, of a convening uh, of a safe space, uh, modeling after um, South Africa mm -hmm. and how they dealt with um, apartheid and the atonement um, and, and that it's, it's a journey, it's not a place, not a final destination, that we need to continue these conversations. Maybe we need to have more um, student representation on the endowment of the colleges mm -hmm. and universities mm -hmm. so that there is more insight into how these universities are deciding how and where they're going to invest. And I kind of use that as an example because um, one of my roles is sitting on CalPERS and CalSTRS, which is about a, set, a $760 billion investment fund investing on behalf of teachers, retirees, state employees. And so the question about divestment always comes up, whether it's from mm. gum and gun and manufacturers or um, uh, fossil fuel, paying attention to ESG, um, the green economy. There's always a, a reason or angle or something that they want that people are, are asking us to divest from. And I think that when people come and they come to the space to come and give testimony and share their perspective that we don't shut them down, mm -hmm. that we don't use fear and intimidation, that we don't, um, that we're, that we're, that we are actually listening, and that they're also having a seat at the table. So, I mean, I think that. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think that that resonates because as we, at my organization, try to shift to to thinking more about conscious capital, I think that's a really great question. Is is you know. What are our demands, and also how do we, on both, on all sides, really understand what the issues are at hand, so that we can build a different kind of society, um, but from a place of us trying to figure it out together? Yes, because I think when you had when you add more people of color and you add more women to whether it's a corporate board, a community board, or any kind of a, a, a community organ, a community situation, you are diver, di um, increasing the diversity in perspective and experience, and that statistically speaking, has yielded more dividend. It is a, not a place to be fearful of. And you know, I'm, 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 I'm looking at the space of how um, um, DEI being attacked, yep. um, budgets, corporations defunding budgets. Um, and in a weird way, it's a compliment mm. that we are moving in the right direction and people are afraid. We cannot be afraid ourselves. We need to stay strong and continue to be led by these convictions and continue to make room for ourselves and our fellow sisters as we continue to move up. So if that's the boardroom or the courtroom yeah. or running for office, um, uh, serving on a border commission, if we have any commissioners here, that is how you continue to move and move the policy agenda so that we, our values are respect are reflected in the policies that are being pre pre passed, um, and that we're filling the pipeline of thought leaders that are going to continue to be in positions of powers for the next 20, um, 25 years. It sounds like the two of us have uh, 
both daughters that will be those people. Um, so you said you have a three-year-old. I also have a three-year-old. And, and when you were saying that, I'm like, yeah, I could see Cameron in that role. And so I, I see Emily and the time the time is, is dwindling down. But I, I think that's where I want to wrap up, if that's OK with you. I want to talk about it closer to home. How do you prepare your daughter or other young women in your family for these varying spaces that okay, we've been I, talking I can about? Stop you right there. I already know how to answer this question. So, I mean, I have, there's like six grandchildren. My daughter is three. But my oldest niece is graduating from high school today. I mean, from middle school going into high school. And I've noticed, like, when she talks, she, like, covers her mouth and she makes it really small. And, like, you have to whisper. I'm like, she's whispering and I'm, like, leaning in. I'm like, you're making me, you're making me work too hard to hear what you have to say. What do you want to say? Just say it. And don't cover your mouth. Right? I mean, and then she's like, tries to stifle her smile. I'm like, what are you doing? Your mom spent thousands of dollars on those braces. <laughs> and I said, where was the little girl that was on the ropes course that was climbing up the pole and saying, I want to go first? What happened to her? And she was like, I don't know. They make fun of me. And da -da -da -da. I was like, we don't play small in this family. We don't play small. If you're not going to play, stay on sideline. We play big and we go bold. And, I, and that is just, you know, and I don't want to intimidate her. I want to bolster her. I was like, listen, you think I'm playing small? You think London Breed is playing small running San Francisco? You think Kamala Harris is up in the White House playing small? Did you see Ocasio, um, uh, her little back and forth just, just the, uh, the other day about eyelashes? That's a real thing. Marjorie Taylor Greene attacked her, and they attacked back. It was, I loved it. And the men, the men cheering. The hearing didn't even know what to do. It was so funny. You gotta find this clip. I'm so, oh my God. Okay, I digress. Okay, so what do I do about Madison? She'll say, "I don't do. I don't want to do that. I'm scared." I said, "Oh no, no, no. Today we're being brave." And I just remind her. And when I pick her up from school, I say, "Were you brave today? Tell me what you did that was a brave thing." Oh, uh, you know, I climbed the, the 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 structure. I was like, "That is amazing. I climbed the structure today too." <laughs> I climbed the patriarchy structure today, Madison. I love it. <laughs> and I chipped away at it. And just like you're climbing that structure, so really using real life examples. Uh, you know, this fear about being fear afraid of the dark. I'm like, we don't, we're not afraid here. We don't have fear. Fear is not in us. Let's go beat up the dark and we go fight the dark. <laughs> Shadow boxing. Just examples to really encourage her. She comes with me on, on events, mm -hmm. speaking events, many, sometimes out of necessity and sometimes just as a growing opportunity. Don't be afraid to bring your littles. Don't be afraid to nurse in public. We need to, we need to normalize motherhood and what it looks like and be mindful that every time you pour in and you bring your, chi your child, because young boys are going to grow up and become men and they need to realize yep. that um, they're an ally in this is that um, this is normal behavior to see mommy on the stage on, and having a microphone and running the program or on a Zoom rocking, you know, if it's bedtime or consoling her, but still conducting, conducting business. Because each one of us are charged with the duty of changing the face of power in the state, in this county, and in this country. And it's not gonna happen by itself. Every one of us have a role of, on it. Whether you have a title, whether you have a position, whether you're elected, whether you're not, it doesn't matter. You're living, you're breathing. That is your mantra. That is your goal every single day, is to make sure that people know that you are here and that you're here to make change. Thank you. Wow. Incredible. I think we're going to open it up some questions. Mm -hmm. OK. So again, I have to please help me in thanking our speakers. I have to confess, this whole event is just for me. <laughs> I have two daughters, and that last question gives me so much life because, I mean, that's real. Not only do they need to see us, and I bring my littles because I have to, um, to work, and it's OK. I went to work with my mom. My mom worked two jobs for as long as I can remember. So after school, we were going to work. And so I, I feel like that should be normalized. It, it paid off for me. And um, I love the idea of my daughter seeing me at work being the boss. They call me Mommy the Boss Gardener because I'm, I'm the boss at work. And then I get my rest and my peace in the garden. So um, I love that. 
Um, I just want to acknowledge changing the face of power. Oh my gosh, I love that. Just like supervisors, our leadership, transformational leadership by all of you who are in this space, in leadership positions, our leadership looks different. And that is so powerful. Um, I also want to highlight the idea of transparency and servant leadership. It is our responsibility to lift up others up as we climb. I'm going to take that with me because that's what this space is about as well, is about creating space for others. Um, so if you didn't know, we're going to take a few questions. There's a QR code on your table. It's the, the flat piece of paper. If you want to submit questions, that's how you do it. Um, we do have a couple of questions. So I think they're for both of you. Let's see how this goes. How do I, as a young professional, take next steps in my career, combat imposter syndrome, and earn respect as more than, wow, you're so young, in quotes. Um, kill imposter syndrome. Just kill it. Get rid of it. It doesn't exist. The same way I told, tell Madison to shadow box the, 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 whatever's in the dark that scares her, you shadow box that imposter syndrome. You're here for a reason and for a purpose. You, know, you, you need to step into that. Uh, I, too, often found myself to be the youngest in many circles. Um, when I was elected uh, on the Board of Supervisors, I was uh, running and won as a 32-year-old, and I was running against uh, many people that were much older uh, than, than me. In this race, there were 21 other candidates, so there was it, was, it was challenging. You use that to your advantage because you're youthful, you have probably more adept to technology, and that's your secret weapon. What was the second part of the question? The first part, the first part. Oh, yeah. OK, so how do you, uh, respect is definitely earned. Uh, for me, I earned my respect by doing my homework and by winning also. <laughs> um, everybody loves a winner. Nobody will mess with a loser. So whatever you do to take on, you want to be successful, you want to you excel in it, you want to become a subject matter expert in, in this area, and then you want to tell everybody that you know your stuff. And um, it's, a, it's a careful line that you want to walk because you don't want to be too boastful. You still want to be humble and you still want to be approachable. Um, but I would say take, for career, you take risk, calculated risk. I think that there are, are women probably around you and in your life that you could tap to help you. Say, hey, there's this conference coming up. Are you buying a table? Can I get a seat at your table? So-and-so is coming to talk. You, you got to ask for what you want. Um, and um, don't ever be sorry. That's, that's my mm. No, that's great advice. I think one of the things I would hold is I've, I've tried to always focus on the big picture. Because um, I think when, when someone is diminishing you and telling you you're too young or you know, you're just this position, um, being able to hold a bigger vision for what's possible is, I think, the secret sauce of a, a younger generation, that we don't need to keep thinking about things the same way they've always been done. And so when you can take calculated risks and put some ideas on the table, um, and then I would say the follow through to make some of those ideas come to happen, that's, that's how you earn respect. Um, but yeah, I, I agree with everything you said. And bring other people along with you. There's many people in this room that have brought me along, and they have taught me to bring other folks along, too. Thank you. Um, and what I also heard you saying earlier was don't play small. I think I've, I am learning that. Don't play small. Be big and go bold. Um, so I think we can add that little tidbit back on to that question. Um, and don't take no for an answer. Especially for someone that can empower you. You can't give a yes. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Um, what practices do you implement in order to disagree and not be disagreeable? Because I, I did hear you say that, and I like had a little question about that. How do you approach those situations cleverly? Cleverly. Um, so there is no cookie cutter approach. 
I think what for me, what I always start with are the facts. What does the data say? Why, why would I vote one way over another? Why would I support a project versus another? What is the, oh, you know, the common good? These are some of just basic questions that I ask myself. Who, what are the pros and cons? What are the adverse effects if I don't support this, if I don't attend, or if I don't speak, or you know, just trying to weigh out and look at the, pro, the, the, um, the, the situation or the question to, uh, you know, syntopically in, in, in a whole, whole way. And then when it comes down to having to deliver bad news, I think about how would I want to receive? So here's a case. I, someone asked for an endorsement and um, I said yes. And then I was asked, can your delegates also support me? And I had to say no. And so I sent this, you know, a very thoughtful text if you ask me, although this person has not responded. I said, you have my full support. I completely know what it's like to be in this position. Unfortunately, I, I'm not able to help you. I can't walk this journey with you. And um, I, I cannot move my delegates in this, in this, in this place, but um, I still support you and you can call on me for other ways. So I mean, that's just a, a, a real time solution of, of being able to say, no, I, I couldn't. And you always intuitively want to help your friends. Um, so it's really hard when you are not able to help someone that has helped you. Um, I hope that example is helpful. I think the thing I'm channeling is I used to tell folks when I was still at Somos from a community organizer standpoint that it's it's a lot easier to convince them if I'm at the table and I'm close enough to flip it over <laughs> rather than being way in the back and like I was disagreeable so I wasn't even let into the room. Um, and so I think I constantly figure out how to channel that energy um, because we can't change it if, if we're ho hollering from the back and we have no space to engage. Now I will say there are some spaces where I think being resolute about what you have to say and you know where your conviction is is really important as well. Um, but I think I've I've learned in different spaces how to navigate that. And actually, I got feedback this week that I'm still learning that, especially in a corporate space, because this is very new for me. How do you channel kind of a core of steel? Is what um, one of our senior leaders said to me. Not that you shouldn't be emotional, but how do you hold the core that? you are rooted in, in your values and who you are, but show that and demonstrate that while still speaking your truth. So I, you know, jury's still out on that. I got to figure out how to do that, but I appreciated that feedback this week. Um, one of the things that I have struggled with, and um, I've been reading the MPQ nonprofit quarterly um, edition that's out right now around black, leader, black women in leadership is how do, how do you stand strong in your power? You know, as um, a woman of color, as someone who's had like a unhealthy relationship to power dynamics, now being put in these positions of leadership, I have this unhealthy relationship with power and, and I, I struggle to stand fully in the power that I have in my organization, in the housing space, and I, I have to do repair around my relationship with power, understanding that power is neutral. It depends on how you use it. So I'm, un I'm interested in how you all like strengthen, lean into, repair that relationship with power to be so strong in leading us in, in these spaces. You know, the first thing that comes to my mind in, in hearing that question is um, uh, a gospel song by artist, Grammy Award winning artist, Mary Mary. And they say they have a line in the song that says, "You see my glory, but you don't see my story," right? And I think that that's something that that resonates with me and related to your question because you see success, right? But you don't see, at least for me, but you don't see or the times I've been crying in the shower, right? Or the time where you have debilitating moments of self-doubt and um, um, that voice in your head said you're not you can't do it or you should have straightened your hair or how why are you even here going back to, to the pre first question about uh, imposter syndrome you really have to find the strength to persevere I'm reminded that I'm not in this space for myself I'm here in this space at this time, but I'm not here for myself. And that I think about 
my daughter and your littles and yours and all of ours, like what are we going to see and do? What is this future gonna look like? And then I also watched some of the Trump hearings. And it also, I find strength in that craziness. Um, to persevere. I have to say that a lot of my strength comes from my religious teaching and upbringing. So I spend time anywhere between five to 30 minutes every day meditating and praying and centering myself on hard things that I have to accomplish. Votes, delivering bad news, delivering good news. Um, my remarks if I'm speaking so that I'm in line with kind of my, my purpose, what I'm supposed to do today. And it's not, there's no simple answer to the question. But yesterday, I, felt, I feel like I'm always tested. They're always testing me, always testing. It's always a test. And I feel like I have to fight every single day and I had a moment where I was just reminded that sometimes it's not my fight, that I can step back, and I guess this goes back into the rest theory, and I have allies. Empower them to go fight, right? That are, in these, that are also in these spaces with you, or in spaces when you are not even there, and you hear about things. Well, why wasn't I invited to that meeting? Um, and then also I have a place that, up to the place that you know, no weapon formed against me is going to prosper, <laughs> simply. And that there is a, pr a table that is set for me in the presence of my enemy. Sorry to go preachy on you, but there are some key principles here that I draw upon. You ask about where my strength comes from. That key principles that I draw upon, like no matter what I see, I'm still gonna come out and I'm still gonna be on top because I know that I'm not in this for selfish reasons. I'm not here doing this work to get rich, to get famous. By the way, I'm, I'm neither. I'm maybe in the hood, hood famous. <laughs> but that I'm here because I hate the systems that are in place that hold women down. I hate not being able to choose what I want to do with my body and that our children don't have that choice. I hate that I can work one hour and still make less money than a man. I hate that there is there are boards and corporations making decisions that impact my life, but there's nobody on that t at the table making these decisions. So that is where I draw my strength from. It's kind of weird, but I guess I'm throwing my strength from this hate. But if hate had to be positive, this is this is this is what is motivating me. That reminds me, like, okay, we may be going through this audit, and it's not a personal reflection of me. I just got here. There's value in this audit and what it's going to reveal. It's an opportunity for me to make things better. And when things get better for me, I make it better for everyone around me. And so just always staying centered around it. Why am I here and what am I supposed to do? You know, I, I can't follow that. That was incredible. I'm like, you're so magnetic. I'm like drawn into everything you're saying. I, what I was actually channeling, and I want to honor some of the leaders that are right here in the center of, of um, the space, um, leaders from the Mountain View Solidarity Fund. Um, because actually that's, that's where I drew my um, in community organizing when um, immigrant mothers who I feel carry the sky, who will take on affordable housing, who will take on education, who will take on gun violence, and they're, they're the same moms. They show up at county supervisor meetings, they show up at city council meetings, and I'll never forget there was a moment where um, I was very new into my role as an executive director. It was a very contentious item. I was kind of worried about what some of the elected officials that I had been building with will say if I put my stake in the ground. Um, and I was trying to convince the leaders that I was working with at that time to, to go out there and, and lead this fight, carry this fight. Um, and a mother named Olivia, who still does this work today in, in East San Jose, said to me, no, this one's yours. We've been doing this day over day. Like, you need to use your positional power. You need to use your title 
to get out there because this is not the day where we're going to be the ones who carry this fight. And so I think that's where I draw my strength and power, even when I feel, you know, nervous or worried um, or have, you know, you said, you know, shake off the the imposter syndrome. I think that's that's kind of who I channel. Um, and if if we have an opportunity to stand with people, we should. Help me thank these wonderful and powerful and lovely women again. I, what I heard, I think our theme is, um, what is it? Oh, we have to make room for ourselves and our sisters. Because we cannot do this alone. This is why spaces like this have to exist Spaces like the Women's, Women's Summit that the Santa Clara County um, does and Supervisor Chavez. We need these spaces, spaces like the Latina Coalition's Women's Brunch. We need these spaces because we are in this together and we cannot do it alone. And we are transforming these spaces that we are in. So again, thank you to all of you who are here. Thank you for con to Controller Cohen to Camille Yanis um, Fontanilla. Thank you, thank you, thank you.